or tape, CDs, DVDs to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom. Write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday afternoon, September the 5th, 1981. Labor Day weekend deliverance seminar being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. This tape is by Glenn and Irma Miller. We are speaking on curses and abominations. <laughs> Jesus as the most important thing in our lives. Then, following the blood of Jesus, is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which guarantees us salvation, because without the resurrection, the blood of Jesus would have been futile. He rose from the dead, victorious over the grave. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, this afternoon, for a few minutes, I'm going to take up a minute a little bit where we were discussing this morning. Now, I'm going to go over a little bit of something that uh, we went over, that we studied here last Sunday morning. Uh, we'll pick up with some of the thoughts that were brought up this morning. Uh, over in uh, Leviticus, in chapter 12 of Leviticus, first five verses of Leviticus we'll look at for a minute. Further off to mention the law of ministration. I can't find any place in the Bible where that law changed. Well, I guess it still applies, my thinking. And this is along with that. The law of ministration says that for seven days a man and wife during that period shall be separated. And then, chapter 12, verse 1 through 5, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman hath conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day shall the flesh of his foreskin be circumcised. And she shall then be continuing in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. And she shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. She shall be unclean for forty days, a male child. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her separation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying for threescore and six days. Total of eighty days. Forty days for a male child, eighty days for a female child. I cannot tell you why God made 80 days and 40 days. I don't know. But anyway, it's God's law, and he must have some reason for it. And it must have something to do with the woman and with her regenerating and with her body coming back to normal and with because it's, it's in his law. And he understands the health laws because he created us. So he understands better than we do. So since he was mentioning that, I just we're just passing over now let's go over to, we're going to another subject now. Revelation 22 and 18. Last chapter of the Bible, four verses from the end. For I testify unto every man that heareth the word of the prophecy of this book. If 
any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plague that are written in this book. He didn't say New Testament. He didn't say the book of John. He didn't say the Psalms. He said that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the word of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book, he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So the last chapter of the book of the Bible tells us that if we alter in any way the word of the Lord, that means keeping it, applying it to our lives, that the plagues that are written in this book shall be our portion. Brother Alton was talking about the rest homes, insane asylums, hospitals. Rest homes are terrible. Insane asylums are horrible. Hospitals are awful. But the majority of it, I believe, if not all of it, comes because we have not kept the word of the Lord. And we are carrying the sins of our fathers and our forefathers before us. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 20. When they say it preached from Revelation to Generation, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. And thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. What's he talking about? Verse 4 says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Then we can turn over and find what God calls some of these things. But here he's applying them to making a graven image, or worshiping them, or making them into a god to serve instead of him, or to, to allow our hearts to worship in some way. We may not even call it a god or something, but we can find ourselves in some way attached to something, and it becomes an idol to us, and we think so much of it that we are not able to throw it away or do away with it because we worship it, in a way. It was brought to my attention just as Drew here is talking about the Mardi Gras, and uh, we, we were talking about it. And, and that that is simply us. The whole thing is, is, is an abomination to God. It, it's a worship of, of lust and sex and pagan God. And you go down there and they throw you a token. Well, what's the token got on it? Everybody wants a token. They make up millions of them to pass out. What are they? Every one of them's got a, a Babylonian God on it. Every single one of them. And when you take that thing and put it in your pocket, you're putting another God on your, on your being and you're becoming accursed of God because you accepted it and you're killing it. Okay, we'll go back down to verse 5 again and pick it up. The Lord says, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, and I visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation. He says he shows mercy to he he will, who he will show mercy. But if my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and then I'm the fourth generation, if we all sin the same sin, we've got the same thing multiplied and stacked up on us. Four, four layers deep. And if we've got it four layers deep, then it's part of our personality and our being, and we don't even know it. And it's become inbred and born into us when we were born. Turn over to uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23. A lot of people's personalities change after they go get some deliverance. They're not the same people anymore. They don't even know some people don't even know themselves. That's right, because they've got this inbred in them. Uh, Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. We have two things here in this first two, uh, uh, second and third verse. We'll take up verse 2 first. A bastard or illegitimate child shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to the tenth generation shall he not enter in to the congregation of the Lord. Now that's talking about going into the... Uh, the house of the Lord into the temple, entering in past, past the altar into, into the temple of the Lord, to the tenth generation. That's 400 years that God forbids the illegitimacy to enter in. Now, you look at uh, uh, 
illegitimates me up, and you'll find it applies to more than just children. It applies to mixed marriages of, of races of people as well. And uh, uh, God, God forbid mixed race marriage. And it is an abomination unto him, the races as they are, are to marry amongst themselves. That is God's blessing. But it's God's curse when the race is mixed. And it's against the word of the Lord. And it's not changed because we live in the day of grace. Verse 3. An Amorite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Who are the Moabites and the Amorites? Lot, children by incest. Incest is forbidden to enter into the congregation of the Lord for ten generations. And the Moabites and the Amorites became a plague to the children of Israel into the inner side. And how many of us are aware or know how much illegitimacy or incest is in our generation 400 years? And we are carrying the burden of those sins on our shoulders. Now, I believe that we, as Daniel of old, I believe that we have the ability, according to the word of the Lord, to come as Daniel did and brought the sins of his nation and the sins of his father and his sins up before the Lord. And then we can ask the Lord to be set free from these things that are on us by doing that and be free from the, the, the curses that, are, that rest over. Well, let's go over to some more. Deuteronomy, uh, Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 20 uh, also carry some of this. And I'm not, we're not going to turn there. I'm just giving you that for a reference so you can mark it down and you can look it up for yourself. It's just reference that goes along with this same, with these same uh, thought. Uh, over in... Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 2 through 5. I'm not going to read that either. Uh, it's just another reference. The Lord talks again about serving other gods, having heathen gods. Uh, it verifies our uh, 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 other uh, uh, verse that I gave you. But in Deuteronomy chapter 27, it is a... Uh, when Moses is instructing the children of Israel, Moses charges the children of Israel. And he tells them, starting with verse 15, the things that God calls cursed in their lives, or if they partake of or do, starting with, chapter, with, with verse 15 of chapter 27. And uh, we'll, just, we'll just run down through. I won't read the whole verses. We'll just get the thought out of each one. Because we have, I don't want to take the whole time here, because we could spend the rest of the camp meeting on these subjects right here, and cleansing that's needed in the house of the Lord with these with these subjects. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord. And he who has it and puts it in a secret place. So a lot of people have idols, of one kind or another, and they... They hide them and have them in a secret place where they think nobody knows where they are. A lot of it's in your heart. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander. Cursed be he that perverteth judgment of the stranger, the fatherless, and widow. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife or uncovered his father's skirt. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his mother, or the daughter of, of his father. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly. Cursed be he that taketh a reward to slay an innocent person. And cursed be, be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law. Okay? Now, Brother Alton touched on a couple of these this morning, but they all apply to us. If one applies, they all apply. And 
we went through these one time in the early part of the year when the Lord first showed this to me, and we took time with each one, and we prayed against the curses that rest upon us and asked the Lord to forgive us of the sins of our fathers and our forefathers of these curses, and then asked the Lord to lift them off of us. You see, Satan don't put these curses on you. The Lord puts them on you when you are, have been a partaker of them, or, or they are visited on you because the Lord says so to the third and the fourth generation back and to the tenth. And we have run into instances where we've gone back as far as thirty generations to break a curse over somebody when we we're praying for them in deliverance. So, so don't stop with the third and the fourth generation if you're praying for somebody and they, you don't seem to be getting the results you want. Keep on going back until the thing breaks and you have a place where you feel that, that the release has come for the person. Because that sin can be continuous and visited down. Now, two other sins that God calls that he puts on us, and they're an abomination unto the Lord. One is for not giving him the glory. I didn't... Uh, yes, so that's in Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, I believe. That's right. Malachi 2, I had it marked down here. didn't realize it. Malachi, just mark it down um, for reference. Then there's another curse that God puts on you. If you don't give God that portion which belongs to him, if you don't give God his rightful portion, your tithes and your offerings, you are cursed with a curse, and you have holes in the bottom of your pocketbook. If you don't give to God that portion that belongs to the Lord. And uh, I think I might have that here too. Yes, that's in Malachi 3. 6 through 12. Okay. Now, over in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, verses 15 clear through 47, we find these same, same items and some more listed again. But in chapter 27, they are called curses. And we are believing and expecting and that the Lord is giving a revelation to many people around the face of the earth, that God is giving a revelation so the people of the Lord can come out from underneath the power and the bondage of Satan. Because you see, Satan has a legal right, and Satan is a legalist. And unless the, his legal right is taken away from him, you can't come into a complete deliverance. But when his legal right is broken, then he has to turn you loose, and he has no more right. And uh, uh, we found a lot of times in praying with people privately and individually, Satan will speak out of them and say, Well, this is my house, I live here, and I have a right to it. That's so. Okay, in the name of Jesus, you tell me what your right is. You'll be surprised. Some of the answers you get, then the person has to ask the Lord to forgive them, confess that, and you break the power, the legal right that Satan has, and it's all over. And they're free. And uh, we, we're, you all are here to learn these things. You're here so you have an understanding and knowledge and, and what he does, and, and how he uh, comes against us, and how he harms us, and uh, uh, how he gets a hold in us, and how we become sick. And we, we, want, we want to learn how to become well. We want to learn how to walk out from under the curse. I believe that we're coming to a time when we'll go back, and the, the Bible tells us that the last curse is, is, is death. And that came when through Adam and Eve. I believe that the day will come when we'll be able to break that curse and walk out from underneath it and come into a, a reality of life eternal by breaking the curse. Now, I may be talking far out, and some of you may not see that I see, but I can see a little glimmer of that down there in ahead of us. I can see a glimmer that there's a, a truth in there I may not understand yet, but I, I feel it and I see it. I don't know how to get there. I don't know what to do. But I see there's something. God's going, God will show somebody someday, and they'll stand forth and declare it, and it'll happen. I believe it. I believe it. Well, I just thought I'd take up for a few minutes and carry on there with, uh, where, because my uh, appetite was witted when he was talking about that this morning, and, and I thought that it would be good for you to have some of these scriptures and things that you can ponder on and work on yourself and look and study and see what you find. Now, I know that we're taught that Jesus became a curse for us and that we're not under the curse that Jesus became a curse. Jesus also died on the cross. His blood was shed, for the Bible tells us that God so loved the world. The world. The world. 
that whosoever calleth. Oh, oh, whosoever calleth. Well, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He died for the world, but the world sure not saved. You get there by calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus became a curse so that we don't have to bear the curse. But that doesn't mean that we're free from the curse because see, we have to learn how to get out from underneath that curse just like we have to come and say, Lord, I come and ask you to forgive me of my sins. We have to call on the name of the Lord. We have to come into a knowledge of it uh, just like we're coming into deliverance. There are many phases of things that, that the Lord's beginning to reveal in the Bible for the army of the Lord to stand forth, to be able to go forth and heal a right sword of the Lord that will cut asunder flesh and bone in yielding the word of the Lord. We don't understand it. We've lost the understanding of it through Babylon and, 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 and through the harlot system. We've lost, and then through teaching, teachings of traditions, we've lost the right understandings of a lot of the scriptures. But God is, is putting out a desire in the hearts of his people to know the word of the Lord and to be able to, to understand it and then to, to stand forth and declare the word of the Lord, thus saith the word of the Lord, and it shall come to pass, and, his, and the captives will and are being set free, and we shall prevail against the gates of hell, and Satan will not be able to stand against us because we shall stand forth with the word of the Lord. It is written, and we shall prevail. Praise the name of the Lord. We are prevailing. Hallelujah. We're, we may not think we're doing much, but we are doing a whole... If, if you can see the other side of, uh, uh, of the curtain, there's great turmoil and distress because of what we're learning and putting into practice. And what's spreading throughout the land... The Lord's raising up. When you go back, you'll have knowledge about deliverance that you never had before, and you'll be able to set the captives free. And that's the purpose of why we study and come together. And we'll be able to be deliverers. For that's what the word, that's what salvation means. It means deliverance. It means being, being saved means being delivered. You, and it is, it is being delivered. It's not delivered, it's being delivered. We are being saved. We are not saved, we are being saved. Some of you may contradict that, but you go look it up and study it. You'll find that that's what it, what it literally says, that we are being saved. And some of us are getting saved, and we hope that we all get saved to where, even to the deliverance of our physical bodies. Amen. And our minds, which none of us really have a, even a little bit of it. Our minds are a computer that exceeds any computer that man can build. Yet our mind is not at the present time because of sin that is visited upon us. Our mind is not able to, to operate and comprehend as it should. We should be able, literally, to take this Bible and, and, and start from page one and go through page, and when we can turn to the last page of the Bible, we should be able to shut it up and come back and repeat it word for word verbatim. I believe that. Adam had that mind, and I would like to have it. I cry for it. I want it. And it's possible. If we look for it, we seek for it, God is making an opening up in roads for us. Honey, come on and carry on here. Praise the Lord. You may all say, well, he's talking out of the Old Testament. So I want to give you a scripture oh, in the... the news. All right. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. I want to read that to you quickly. Now, all of these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonitions. Talk about children of Israel. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's us. We're at the end of the world. You know that? We are. And all of these... Examples is talking about murmuring, committing fornication, idolaters, lust, uh, all of these things that overthrow the children of Israel in the wilderness and they died. This is a way out. God has made a way out. And there is a way out. But we are going to be judged by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I heard Glenn, I was listening, and it said, And the Lord said, or and God said, We're going to be judged by those words. We've been taught so long that we go by the New Testament, but but usually we can receive Psalms 23 or Isaiah 53, but we're going to be judged by every word. Are you with me? 
That's what the Bible says. All right. I want to go because Drew has been so beautifully teaching us about and ministering the discerning of evil spirits and good spirits, the gift of the discerning of spirits. And I want to show you in Hebrews and the seventh verse, talking about Jesus. He is our pattern, isn't he? Jesus is the pattern who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, this is the Son of God, unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, we don't like to hear anything about suffering. We like to confess everything is lovely and rosy. But we have to come in to a portion of the fellowship of his suffering. That's in the Word of God, too. Now, we may not like it, but the Lord allows certain sufferings to come our way when we are disobedient. And that shapes us up if we hate the woodshed. But if we kind of like it there, it'll just keep us, you know, rebellious. We'll keep on being rebellious, and he keeps putting his hand upon us and showing us how many know what rebellion means. It means to disobey God. That's what it means. Or disobey, you know, if a child's rebellious, that means he doesn't want to mind his mother and father, doesn't it? So when we don't obey God, we are rebellious toward God, and he says you'll have to be taken to the woodshed. And that, that comes through suffering. And I've had a little bit of it myself, but I want to read on now. Uh, I, I, we were telling Drew the other day how when we, we'd been here about a year, and one time during camp meeting we were summoned into court to, have, to go to the uh, mental health department to be, I guess you call it, psyched out because of casting out demons and speaking in tongues. That was really a glorious experience. We might have suffered before we went, but by the time we got back, we were praising the Lord because we saw something. They gave us this long questionnaire. Glenn and I, we were in a room by ourselves, and they told us not to talk, but I was reading down and marking my answers, and all of a sudden I caught on. The Lord just spoke to me. And I said, Glenn... Be careful how you're answering these questions. They're, they're tricky. One of them was, do you belong to a church? So I wrote, no. I wasn't lying. I don't have my name on any roll of a church. Uh, another one was, does your pastor tell you you're going to hell? All right, I wrote, No. Because Glenn doesn't tell me I'm going to hell. He thinks we're, we're both going to go into heaven together. Praise God. <laughs> and the Lord just, just allowed us to see how the thinking of the world out there and what is coming upon the earth. And we better be ready for it. We're only ready for it as we have the light of the Lord within us. The Jesus in us is going to be our protector. The angels of the Lord round about us. I just thought I'd throw that in. I want to go down to the 13th verse of Hebrews. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. Babies drink milk. And I fear that too long I had too much milk and not any meat to chew on. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I'll never forget one time Dick Mills put his hand on my head, quoted this scripture over me, and, and commanded that my spiritual senses would be opened up. And from that day on, the gift of discerning of spirits became very easy. In fact, some people think I'm spooky and other people are spooky afraid of me. But I know what the Lord shows me, and when the Lord shows it to us, it's always right. It may not be what we all want to hear. Many times people will walk right up to me, lovely Christian people, 
and make a face, their tongue will come out of their mouth and swish like a fang of a snake. Well, that used to really shake me because I didn't want to see that on certain people especially. <clears throat> Other people become animals right in front of me. You heard him this morning when he was when he was up here teaching and telling how that spirit manifested. That was the spirit of a dog or a wolf manifesting in that. The Bible talks about wolves in sheep's clothing, and I see a lot of them. I see them. And some I don't want to see. But the Lord requires that we pray for those people and love them. Because it isn't the real them. It's what's in them that doesn't belong in there. And we must pray and seek God and intercede for their deliverance. And that's why we're here. Sometimes people will walk up to me and the foul, unclean, evil, sexual spirits on them. They can be so clean and so pretty and so beautiful and so lovely, but that aroma comes out of them, and it just, oh, it's, it's horrible. But I'll know how to pray for them then. And you don't always have to tell them, but sometimes the Holy Spirit would have you tell them. One time we were at a full gospel convention <coughs> in um, Fresno, California, Labor Day. And we didn't know, I didn't know very much about deliverance at all. Of course, I thought I did, you know, but... But I really didn't know very much, and we still don't know Amen. what we should know. But we're learning. I saw everybody left to go to lunch, except the convention secretary and uh, from downtown and myself. And she went to the powder room. She said, would you sign in anybody if they come? So I said, okay. She left. And right away, here comes a, a woman up the ramp. There's a long ramp, and I could see her. She had on purple pants. That was the days before pantsuits even were fashionable. She had a long leopard coat. Now, remember, Fresno, California, it's about 110 degrees. Long leopard coat. She had on a white chiffon scarf tied around her head and draped all the way down to the bottom of this coat. And I looked at her and I really thought it was the bar girl coming to open the bar, which was across the way there. But she walked right up to me and she said, is this where you register for the full gospel convention? I said, yes, it is. And I handed her this paper and you want me to use that one? and uh, she signed her she signed up and i picked it up to look at it to type her name on a nameplate and i looked her looked at her i couldn't read and i said what is your name and a voice off of her shoulder said i'm Jackie, i'm Jackie. i said what did you say she said i didn't say anything well talk about getting chuck up <laughs> I don't know what it meant. Of course, sometimes, uh, sometimes I see these things, and it'll be days before the Lord reveals to me what it is that He's trying to tell me. And I had to go to the minister who actually brought us into deliverance, Brother Duck, and I. And I told him about it. I said that was weird. He said, "Don't you know what that is?" I said, "No." He said, "She has a Jackie Kennedy spirit. Jackie at that time was the head of all fashion, and." It wasn't, a, it wasn't a month until, see, that spirit was telling her, you look like Jackie Kennedy. And uh, it wasn't a month till I was in, a, in the beauty shop and I picked up a magazine and there was Jackie with that same outfit on. These spirits can transfer to us so easily and it is a learning process that the Lord puts us through to keep them, or if they get on us, to cast them right off. And that's why we need this gift of discerning of spirit. Somebody come up here last night, and, and when Brother uh, Drew began to pray for him to receive it, he said he didn't want it. Now, that was the devil talking right out of that boy. That was the devil. You have to pick that up with your ears. That was not that young man. I know that young man. The devil doesn't want him to know what's evil and what's good. You see that? And there are many, many ways that the... The enemy can be detected. All you have to do, when I have a counseling session, I always have a pad there, and I just listen to them talk. People tell me. And I start writing down, because right away, most everybody has a lot of unforgiveness and hatred. Almost everybody. And the unforgiveness, I believe that 
mostly our healings will come as we forgive other people. That's just a little thing I throwed in. Now I'm going to talk to you about intercessory prayer ground and for us, and I'm going to talk to the women first. Charlene Fight brought me this scripture, or showed it to me, and I'm going to use it with her permission. Uh, she read it out of the Amplified, but I forgot my Amplified, so I'm going to read it out of the ninth chapter of Jeremiah, and I'm speaking to the women. Every woman in here, everybody in here has a ministry. It might be in your prayer closet. 17th verse, you have it, 10th cha- a ninth chapter, 17th verse. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider ye and call for the morning women, that they may come and send for cunning women, that they may come, and let them make haste and take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may run down with tears and our eyelids gush out with water. For a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. We're, we're always thinking about, let's go up to Zion. That's that high peak in the Lord. Let's go up to Zion. And out of Zion, the people that reach that high peak is going to come travail and intercession for God's people. Now, women have a lot of time on their hands. I have so many women tell me, oh, I don't know what to do with myself. I have so much time on my hands. Well, I wish I could say that some days. I don't have any time on my hands from early morning to late at night. But a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. How are we spoiled? We are greatly confounded because we have forsaken the land, because our dwellings have cast us out. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth, and teach your daughters wailing, and every one her neighbor lamentation. For death is come up into our windows, and is entered into our palaces. You heard him talking about suicide today. Children, how many people here have children that that you are praying for that their lives will change? And grandchildren. And all you people who don't have any children, it will be your business to pray for other people's children. Don't just intercede for yourself all the time. That is so petty and small. That's a sign of a small spirit. Really, always thinking about your own self. Let's pray for others. Let's get with this travail in the Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to pray through us. And I, I petition all the women here this afternoon to pray for Lake Hamilton Bible Camp and for all of the people who come here to be delivered. They come by the droves. Early morning, some come by night. They don't want to be seen, you know. They can't. Some call. Some calls at three o'clock in the morning. We had a call last week. Really, it was funny, but it wasn't funny either. We had a call last week. Three o'clock in the morning. It rang. The phone rang about six or eight times before I could get myself out of bed. And uh, this woman said to me, uh, "Are you Miss Miller?" I said yes, and she told me her name. I have already forgotten it. She said. Um, I need prayer bad. I said, okay. What seems to be your problem? She said, I just had a hot flash. So I said to her, well, is this the first one you've ever had? She said, no, I have them all the time. I said, well, did you have them in the daytime yesterday? Yes. I said, well, why didn't you phone me in the daytime? I sure would have felt better about praying than in the middle of the night. But I prayed for her and bless her heart. She said, well, I just woke up and I just thought about it and I decided to get up and call you. Some people have come to me and they say, I sure envy you. Well, you sit where I sit for a while, you may not, you might get rid of your envy. <laughs> Praise God. Now, I want to know how many women here will, by the grace of God and by the help of God, Dr. Noel's laughing, he's a doctor, he probably has to work day and night. How many women here will stand up and say, I'd like to be an intercessor for those people who come to Lake Hamilton Bible Camp to be helped. Will you stand? Those that really want to pray. Those that really want to weep and cry in your prayer closet. I'm not going to count you, and I'm not going to take your name. I'm just going to believe that God is going to put certain things on your heart to pray for families, to pray for children, 
and that God will anoint you because the Holy Spirit is in you, the anointing is in you, and we need prayer here constantly. The people that come here are what I call the many people who come alone and during the week and at night are what we call drastic cases. They could not go into any church in this whole... You may sit down, and I thank you. They can't go into most churches and, and tell the thing that's troubling them, but they can come here because that is what this place is destined by God to be. And, and we are happy to pray for them, and we are glad to pray for them. Now I'm going to challenge you men. In Ezekiel 9... In chapter 4, Glenn touched on this yesterday. Now, this is a little heavy. This is the abominations of Jerusalem, and we could put in the abomination of Christians or the church today. Use that word. Ezekiel 9, 4. Put this, write this on your pad and go over this. Study this. There's a lot to this verse. It's very heavy. The Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh the men. I thought women were all the intercessors, but the men that sigh and cry for all of the abominations. That's not sin. It's not the sins. That's abominations. What are abominations? How many know what abominations are? How many know that, that there are abominations that God calls out, that he hates? He hates them. Yes, sir. The abominations that be done in the midst of the church. I want you to think about that. Let the Holy Spirit just settle down now over over your mind. The abominations that are in the midst of us right here. Now, I'm going to read very quickly. I'm going to go through a, a list of what God calls abominations. Now, I'm not going to elaborate too much because the time is late, but I'm asking that the Holy Spirit will prick your mind and open your understanding and your knowledge. Now, many of us have been churchy for years, and we have, we must admit that we've come so far and we're we haven't gone any further. So there is a reason. And the Lord has showed Gwen and I and many, many other people across the land the problem. It's the sin, the abomination, the iniquities, the, when you know to do good and don't do it, the lawlessness in our hearts. Uh, you might want to, you don't have to turn to these. I'm going to go through them fairly fast because this is going to shake some of you. And it's going to cause you to study your Bible. All you have to do is get a strong concordance and start looking up the abominations. What does God call abominations and what does he hate? I think one of Belzebub's friends are up here. Isaiah 65, 2 to 5. God says these things are an abomination to him. Rebellious people. As rebellious Christians. The sinners are already... You know, I used to condemn the racetrack when I came by, that racetrack, and I'd say, those stupid people gambling all their money away from the poor little children and everything, and I'd be struck by a spirit. And I know I'd been struck, but I didn't know exactly. I thought I was doing something... I didn't know I was talking out of turn, condemning those poor sinners. But one day a minister was here, and I told him I got something on me from that racetrack, and he said... Uh, when did it come on you? And I said, when I came by the racetrack. He said, it, it came on you because you condemned those people. The Holy Spirit just showed him. He says, those are sinners. Those are sinners. But these are abominations of Christians, rebellious Christians, who refuse to obey the word of God after they've been taught and taught and seen and see shown. They've come up to truth. They don't want to walk in it. So they are rebellious. And the Bible says that is the same as witchcraft. We become like witches and warlocks when we won't obey the word of the Lord. People who walk after their own thoughts, that's an abomination to God. 
People who provoke God to anger continually right in his face, sinning and people who sacrifice in gardens, people who burn incense. The incense is the praise and the worship. The Bible says, in many places, that incense is an abomination to God. If you've been burning incense in your bathroom or your house, it is an abomination to God. People that eat swine's flesh is an abomination to God. And the broth of abominable or impure things in their vessels. People that stand by themselves and come not near to the Lord. They don't want to, you know, the children, they didn't, really, they didn't want to go up and see the Lord. They just stood at their tent's door. People who stand afar off, they don't want to come up and, and really seek the Lord. Ezekiel 4.14. Ezekiel said, I have not eaten that which dieth of itself. Paul talks about that. Or is torn in pieces. <coughs> Or he hasn't had abominable flesh put in his mouth. If you want to know what the abominable things are, you look in the Bible under abominable flesh, and you'll find it. Leviticus. People who haven't touched unclean things. Or eat of flesh that sacrifice peace offerings. That's in Leviticus. Go back to Ezekiel. God gave him a little hole in the wall to look in, didn't he? Remember? What did he see? Often talked about it today in New York, all these horrible pornography pictures and everything. He saw that right in the temple. He saw that. Wicked abomination that my people do in my temple. Every form of creeping thing and detestable, abominable beast, idols. We had one man come here, and he was having so much trouble, and he had a Buddha. And he had buried it in his garage, and he was a builder. And people would, he'd build houses, and they'd never pay him. And we started questioning him, and he finally admitted. Because we kept seeing in the spirit of Buddha, and he finally admitted that he had one. And we said, well, where is it? And he said, I buried it in my garage. I brought it home from the war. We said, well, you're going to have to get rid of it if you want any help. And he said, can I go get a drink? And he walked out and drove away. Now, that is stubbornness and rebellion in the worst way. And the poor man, the last time I heard, he was in terrible straits. Ezekiel talks about women women weeping for Tamaz. If that isn't sickening, silly women. I used to sit, stand behind uh, the book table at conventions, and I would, sometimes speakers would get up that were so far away from the things of God and speak out, and they'd be even homosexuals speaking up there. And these old women, silly old women, would come and tell me, wasn't that sweet? Wasn't that just the best sermon you ever heard? And I'd say, no, it was horrible. I couldn't even believe it, but I saw it this morning when Austin was teaching. They were coming in to the rest homes in the old people's homes, and they were coming in with a reprobate mind. Can you imagine what it was going to happen? There's hundreds of women, silly women, weeping over Tamaz. Who was Tamaz, Glenn? It was Esther's son who she married as her husband, and he was killed by Thor Rose Mother. It was the third day, and that's where the Queen of Heaven and for the... Uh, resurrection originally comes from in Babylon right after four generations after Noah. And that's what they, they, that's when Easter really began. That's the beginning of Easter. The celebration of the rising of tomorrow for the day, not Easter. How do you like that? People who worship the sun, you know that in Arizona especially, <clears throat> they have all those sun gods everywhere, you know. There's a, there's a, uh, family here, they were telling me about it. They had a sun god on the door, and they were having all kinds of freaky fires in their house, brand new house, and all kinds of things. And they had decorated their kitchen with these beautiful, what they said were beautiful, sun gods. They had brought an evil god into their house. People who put the branch to their nose, or an insulting gesture. We've just gone through that with the ball player, haven't we? Did you hear that? They even put him out of the ball park. They put him in a mental place to be checked. 
Ezekiel 5, that's an abomination to God. If you've done that, you better repent, see? Ezekiel 5.11, Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things, and with all thine abominations. Therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eyes spare, neither will I have pity. Ezekiel 20 and 7, God said unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourself with the idols of Egypt. The ways of Egypt begin to come in when we got the movie Cleopatra. You are old enough to remember when that came in, that that was the ways of Egypt that began to come in to Liz Taylor. Hosea 9.10, But they, Israel, your fathers, went to Baal of Pur, a high mountain, and worshipped Baal. Zechariah 9.7, And I will take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth. Deuteronomy 7.25, The carved images of their gods shall you burn with fire. We've burned many Buddhas around here. This pond out here is our, I don't know what you call it, a pit, I guess. <laughs> Bottomless pit out there. And we, I, it's like that when we go to try to close it up and cover it, but we, we have thrown Buddhas out there and we've had fires out there of all kinds of idols and false gods. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thy house. The children of Israel were not to take up with the ways of the heathen. And I was listening to a tape the other day of Brother Hammond's, and he said, Most things bought in curio shops should never be brought into your house. I say, pretty. Of course not. They're idols. Lest you become a cursed thing like it if you bring it in. Now, we've had our experience. Yes, Brother. Deuteronomy. 726. We've had our turn here with uh, frogs and owls. And a girl who was dying of cancer right up the street here, dying with cancer. Uh, and the Lord, through many circumstances that I won't go in today, we do have it in an article in the magazine. The Lord sent me there. She's a lawyer's wife, and I did not know her. I know her mother. And she was when, when I knocked at the door, the father opened the door, and he was crying, and I said, what's wrong? And he said, well, they gave her up today. And I said, well, I didn't know she was so sick. And he said, yes, she has cancer of the stomach and intestines. And I said, oh, my land. I walked in there, and the power and anointing of the Lord was over me like a tent, the fire of God. And I wish I could have that all the time, because things really happen when that happens. And God has promised it to us. He's promised us the hundredfold anointing. We're going to have it. We're going to have it. But I walked in there and I took one look at her and I heard myself say, it come from deep down, I don't know how to pray for you in English. I'll have to pray for you in other tongues. She was a Nazarene. My head would have never said that. But she said, that'll be all right. She was sitting on, the, popped up in that bed. She looked like a little old witch like this. And she weighed 68 pounds, and she did not even look like a human being. But I didn't know exactly what I was seeing. And I began to pray in the spirit, and uh, the sheaf of light from that heaven, that glow, that wonderful anointing came down upon her. And she just started taking it, taking it in, and drinking it in. And I realized that the Lord was doing something wonderful and great for her. And... It wasn't very long, and her mother was there with, little, with the her, this girl's little girl, and she said, I'm going to leave you here, and you stay here and visit and pray, and I'm going to go and take it. So when I turned around to go sit in the chair where the mother was sitting, I turned around like this, and behind me were pictures bigger than this, all over the wall, solid of every kind and description of owls. And I did not... I, I heard myself say again, oh, my land, these are the things that's making you sick. And if she would have said, well, give me the chapter and verse, right then I couldn't have. <clears throat> I had no idea what the Lord was showing me. I just saw all those as demons, and they were looking out. And she said, well, this one over here. And I, I, and I said, and that one's the king in here. She said, oh, he, he really looked mean when you spoke in tongues. He never looks mean at me, but he Look at me, at me now. And I said, well, he's got to come out of here. you got to get this stuff out of here. It's a long story, but it took her 
about two weeks to bring herself to burn up and get rid of those things. And she was healed. Are you saying, Irma Miller, that cancer is caused by these things? Yes, I am. I am. That's one of these abominations are what is causing the people of God to be sick. And the wrath of God is falling. And we had to come home. You know, I even had dish towels in my kitchen cupboards that had owls on them. This girl even had a great big toy box this tall of a frog with a great big old poppy eyes looking right at this poor little child as she slept. And this child was already sexually molesting herself and saying, I hate Jesus. I like the devil. Three years old. Three years old. So we don't need these abomination things in our house. And you can look and read and see what is an abomination to God. There's a long list of them. And remove them out of your house and things will be different. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 18. This is kind of condensed, but it's a pe people who dream dreams. Silly dreams. Lord, and it's the devil giving them. And to God. Those people are an abomination to God to go out and tell those dreams. Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any or sheep wherein there is a blemish or any defect. Now, I'm a preacher's daughter, and I can truthfully tell you that in the early days of Pentecost, the parsonage got the rotten apples and, and all of the things you want. As an abomination to God, God requires the best. Nine. Then he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel is exceedingly great. And I can say to you, the iniquity in the church of the living God is great. And none of us are really free of it, but we want to be free of it. There is people that come here that eat blood. That's an abomination to God. Titus 1.16 they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable. And in that, the way it's used there is the Hebrew, dis disobedient unto every good work and reprobate. Now then, go to Leviticus 18, 6 through 30, and that's where Glenn read you. And that's sleeping with your brother or your father or your uncle and all. When I wrote that article in the magazine, Is Incest a Problem in the Church Today? You will never know how long it took me to write that and how, how terrible I was fought. But a man came here all the way from the East Coast, and he said, when I read that, he said, I used to make fun of your magazine, throw it down, laugh, have a big time. When you wrote that article, I realized you knew what you were talking about, and you could help me. And he came, homosexuality. Praise God, and he was delivered. Oh, Isaiah... Or no, let's go to Deuteronomy again. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14. People who make their children pass through fire. Or that uses divination. An observer of times, a horoscope. All these are abomination to God. We're in trouble with God. When we do this, enchanters, uses omens. Witches who uses incantation and magic formulas. There's a lot of Pentecostal witches. If you don't believe, stay around here for a little while. Charmers who hypnotize people. Doctors who hypnotize. Dentists who hypnotize. I don't care if the doctor did do it. It is wrong. It's of the devil. A consulter of mediums, crystal balls, and fortune tellers. Wizards who peep and mutter. And all that do these things is an abomination unto God. Deuteronomy 22, 5. The woman that shall wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. It is so sickening. We were in New York once. I was telling Alton about it last night. These sweet little men who come out in their pink satin suits and their long fingernails and their painted fingernails and their firm hair and all of this sickening that's an abomination to God. And we have long, too long condoned in America. Everybody should write to President Reagan and complain bitterly. Right up here, the Cubans who came here, they have given them, the government gave them $250,000 to build a gay church. 
You ought to write and scream and scream. It does good. Don't think it don't. Write to your congressman. Complain. That's your money. That's God's money being used for things like that. That's an abomination to God. Deuteronomy 23, 18. Thou shalt not bring the heart of a harlot. Everybody, all you men know what that means. Or the price of the dog into the house of the Lord. For even both of these are abomination to God. Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. Man who takes wives who are unclean or indecent. How many know we're supposed to pray to the Lord for mates? Not just run out haphazardly and grab a man and, and marry him just because you want a husband or men who go out and find a, a wife to marry. Pray to the Lord that the Lord will send the right person. And that's an abomination if you don't. People who water witch wells. Yes, Mark? Mm -hmm. Sodomy. That's right. Unjust weight, imbalance of all kinds, unbalance of all kinds. One time the Holy Spirit said to me, you are unbalanced physically, spiritually, and mentally, and my people are unbalanced. And that was long before, well, about a month before we met Joe Papel in Chicago at the World Convention. He was praying for people's legs to become lengthened and, and straight so we'd be balanced. And I had one leg shorter than the other, and the Lord took me back in a vision and showed me when my mother discovered, when fitting on a dress, that one of my legs was shorter than the other. And that is a birth defect, which is also a curse. Uh, Deuteronomy 27:15. Cursed be he who maketh any graven or molted images. They are an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putting it in a secret place. We went over that a while ago. Deuteronomy 27, 16 through 26. Cursed be, listen to this, young people and older people alike, who dishonoreth your mother and your father, who removes his neighbor's landmark, who maketh the blind to wander out of the way. That's a mean trick, isn't it? Who perverteth the justice do of the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, who lieth with his father's wife, who lieth with any manner of beast. I think that's a law in the in the sheep country, isn't it? If they catch any person lying with a, a sheep, it's a felony, I'm sure. Uh, who lieth with his mother-in-law or his mother's daughter, who smiteth his neighbor secretly, and I'm telling you, words coming out of this mouth can smite your neighbor. God says in Deuteronomy 32, 16, it's an abomination for those who provoke him to jealousy. There's strange gods. Someplace else he says, going a whoring after other gods. That provokes God to anger, and it is an abomination. Proverbs 3, 32, the forward perverse mouth is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Seven things are an abomination unto him. A proud look. A lying tongue. People who tell lies about Christians. as an abomination unto God. Hands that shed innocent blood. Murderers. Look. Abortions. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. The imaginations of the heart are wicked, aren't they? Who can know it but the Holy Ghost? Turn the light on all of us, Lord. Show us our hearts. Feet that are swift. To run to mischief. They just can't wait to run to mischief. False witnesses that lie. Plain lie. He that soweth discord among the brethren. Causes trouble. Just going from house to house. Sowing discord. That is an abomination to God and it's a curse. And it's very prevalent in the church today. Lying lips. It goes all through Proverbs. All through Psalms. Because of the multitude of your whoredoms, Nahum 3, 6. It used to be that you, they had houses to go to. Now it's motels and hotels. And it's very prevalent. You can pick up different statistics, and, and it's very prevalent to swap wives, 
and, and to do all those things to our president, that's an abomination unto God. It's harlotry. Jeremiah 16, 18. I will recompense their Judah's iniquity. That's the praisers. Judah means praise. The praisers' iniquity and their sin double. He's going to give people who praise God and do these things a double portion of problems. Because they defile my land, they have filled mine inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. 1 Kings 21, 26. Nahum did very abominable in following after idols. Saul did that too, didn't he? See, when Saul was small in his own eyes, then he listened to the Lord. But the minute he wanted to listen to the thoughts of his own heart, he got into trouble. Leviticus 20:13. Homosexuality, man that lieth with man. Isaiah 66, 3 to 4. They've chosen their ways, their soul delighteth in their abomination. They did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. Sacrifices of the wicked is abomination. Proverbs 15, 8. Proverbs 15, 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. Proverbs 15, 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. That evil thoughts. See, these things have to be rated up and ask the Lord to remove the curse off of us. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is proud in heart, everyone who is proud in heart, is an abomination to the Lord. He shall not be unpunished. That's frightening, isn't it? I tell you, God is a God of love, and he loves us, and he wants us to straighten up. That's why we have all this. But his wrath balances out his love. I used to spank our little girls, pretty little fat pink legs that were so cute, with a little switch when she was rebellious. And it hurts God to have to do that to us. It hurts him. It hurts him. He grieves. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He's precious in us. And if we continue... When we know to do good and don't do it, what does the Bible say? To sin. Proverbs seventeen fifteen. He that justifieth the wicked. Have you ever heard people who just justify all kinds of things that are wicked? Just condone it and, and they don't come against it? When you quietly sit quietly, when things, when you know that things are wrong, you should speak right up and say, no, that isn't right. We were in a meeting recently, and, and the preacher got up and said, we're all way past the gift. I thought, way past the gift? Then, then man, you're past Jesus, because Jesus is the nine gifts of the Spirit. I sat there and waited to see what else he's going to say, and he said, we're way past the five-fold ministry. And I thought, well, I don't know where we are, but, but I haven't seen the church perfected yet. We're going to be perfected by the five-fold ministries, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, and the evangelists. Every one of them are sent to us to perfect us and to help us. If you're sitting in a church where only the pastor preaches week in and week out, 52 times a year, and you're not having apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers come in, you better run for your life. You'll never be perfected. I hate to come down on you. But I'm going to make you think. Now, you don't have to believe a word I'm saying if you don't want to. But you can look in the Bible. But I'm telling you, we're at the end. We're right at the end. We, we don't have any more time to play around and wait. And this truth is coming forth. We've had this for about three years. I've never, ever brought it before. Never. It took a long time to compile this. Another girl helped me do it. Proverbs 28, 9. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayers shall be an abomination. You know, I, people come up and say, we're not under law, we're under grace. Well, I'm telling you, we're going to be judged by every word that cometh out of the mouth of God. Jeremiah 2, 7. When ye entered the promised land, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. Jeremiah 6, 15. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. Neither would they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I shall visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Revelations 21.8. Fearful and unbelieving are an abomination to God. 
and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers. That's the people who take pills. Sorcery is the taking of drugs. Pharmacia. Idolatry. Liars. 21A. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. I have burnt my finger on my stove, and one second of that is enough for me. I don't want to go to the lake of fire. I really don't. Leviticus 20, 23. People come in and say, well, well, all my friends are going to be in hell. I'll just go there with them. They don't even know what they're saying. Leviticus 3. Ye shall not walk in the manner of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I them, the Lord says. You don't think there's vexation of heart and spirit. It really is. Titus 1.16, they, pro- they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. A profession without a walk. How many people do you know that are so zealous? Oh, they want to run out and deliver the world, but they don't have the walk to back it up. And Satan will pick them off every time. It's because the Bible says in Titus 1.16, reading on, it's because of an abomination and disobedience, and unto every good work it's reprobate. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. And then in spiritualism, people who have partaken in spiritualism, gone to fortune tellers, spiritualist mediums, clairvoyants, palm reading, tea leaf reading, cards, playing cards, get those cards out of your house. They're abomination to God. Ouija board. I prayed with a little girl today that had played with a Ouija board. Needed help. Astrology. Black magic in any form is an abomination to God. All of these things may, may seem to you like, oh, we'll never get out and come out from all of these. But God made a way, didn't he? Through the blood of Jesus, we can be cleansed. Through the blood of Jesus, we can be. And through the blood of Jesus, we can be redeemed if we want the Lord. If we'll let the Lord do it for us. Through the name of Jesus, we can be delivered from curses. Through the blood of Jesus, we can be, in the name of Jesus, we can be delivered. And by thorough repenting, I tell you, repentance is not our style, and we need to do more of it. We haven't even known, mostly, and there's page after page here of abominations, that God says an abomination to him. In Psalms 119, you ought to read that whole psalm every day. Psalms 119 is talking about the ordinances and the precepts and, and, and all of that, the commandments of the Lord that we haven't kept. And, and David is constantly crying out to God for help. This is serious business. And I just pray right now that the Holy Spirit will fall upon you with that you will want to get rid of these abominations out of your not bring any more of them in. Lest you become a cursed thing like them. Jesus, I just pray, Lord, now that you will cause this word to sink deep into their heart. And help us, Lord Jesus, to come out from under all these things, to be numbered with the overcoming, to be numbered with those that have made their garments white. Lord, help us to sigh and cry over these abominations in thy church. Lord, we've wandered so long. How can we become without spot or wrinkle or blemish? This is one way, Lord, that you've showed us that we can come into a walk that you have planned and made a way for us. Lord, you became a curse. And we're asking you now to forgive us of our abominations and our sins and iniquities that have come up to you and caused you even to weep. Jesus, please give us another chance to repent. We really don't want to die in the wilderness. We do not want a reprobate mind. Oh, Lord Jesus, cause the men to sigh and to cry. Like in Ezekiel 9, 4, the Lord said unto them, Go through the midst of the city. Men are strong. We women are the weaker vessels. And I claim, boy, I claim weakness a lot, especially when you have to go out there and pick up something. I'm too weak for that. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of the church, and set a mark upon, on the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry 
For me, I want to be one of those people that are sealed in the forehead. I want to be crying out for the abomination that's in the church today. I want to be one of those. Because, here's the key now. Here's, the, here's what you need to listen to. And to the others... He said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite them. But that, look, not your air, I spare them, neither had ye pity. Now, this is God talking to the man in white, women. Lay utterly old and young, maids, little children, women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary, the church. In there first. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the, the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the court with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and flew in the city. Now go to Revelation 7 3. Well, maybe I should start at the stop, top, the first verse. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel standing from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, to whom it was given, to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God." In their forehead. The Bible tells us there's only going to be a remnant. But he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Say it's the Spirit of the Lord today. Now I realize it's late and we have to have dinner. And we have to let you people go. But I want every head to bow and I want you to allow the Holy Spirit talk to you and the Lord to talk to you. If you feel led and if you want prayer about this, for the Lord to help you clear out these abominations and help you to repent, I want you to come forward. Just keep your eyes closed, praying. Let the Holy Spirit just move you. If you don't feel to come, if the Holy Spirit isn't tugging at your heart, don't come, but if he is tugging, please come and obey him. You'll grieve him if you don't. The whole time my sister was talking, I kept hearing over and over from the Holy Spirit, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. Receive this knowledge this day. Open your heart and search your heart. And I just had a sister told me, that I'm not sure, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. And if there's any of us that are not sure about this, I sure want to get before the Lord and humble myself and say, Lord, I don't understand all of this, but if I'm in error, Lord, I don't want this on my conscience. Please, Lord, take this, this curse of abominations off of me. For the next 20 seconds, there was a short in the microphone wire, and a portion of that sound is still carried over in the balance of this tape, for which we are sorry but unable to do anything about. You know, there's enough people in this town that name the name of Christ turn this whole world upside down. And God is going to give us this glory when he can trust us with it. He cannot give it to, to us until every bit of pride is out of us, until everything that is abominable is out of us. Because we would not only destroy ourselves, we'd destroy people. And he's going to give us this glory. But we're going to have to shape up. Doctor, we can sign cry over the little children that you doctors that are under curses. All of these little deformed children that are born to drug addicts and to people that are under such heavy curses. Lord, help Dr. No to come into a revelation that he can lay his hands on them. And the power of God will flow through his hands and heal the sick. Bless him, Lord. Bless your people. Bless the ministers, Lord. Bless them, we pray. Wash us, Lord. Wash our minds. Cleanse our minds, Lord Jesus. We receive the mind of Christ this afternoon. Jesus is Lord. Remember, Paul said, these things are our examples. 
to the people that the ends of the earth have come. Do you realize that we're almost through 6,000 years and the millennium is about ready to begin? We are just through. The clock is ticking away. On the book table is one book that everybody should have in their possession to read. It's called Mystery Babylon. We're coming out of the Babylonian church system. There's many things still hanging on us, and until you get the knowledge, you won't know. And then there's something called The Two Babylons. It's a harder book to read, but it's a, a wonderful study book. I would admonish you to watch your lips. You may not have understood even one-third of what was read. I read out of the Bible, you know. I read it off a piece of paper, but it's typewritten from the King James. But be careful how you throw this out. Put it in your pantry. You may not have even understood three verses, but keep whatever you can. And don't toss the other out. Wait on the Lord and see if you don't hear this somewhere else. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.